All right. Happy Friday. It's uh, October 30th. I am starting your digestion. Uh, my goal is to do about the first 50 so slides today and then follow up um, hopefully Tuesday with the second group of slides and then get to metabolism on Wednesday of next week so that way um, for your cheat sheet test which is coming up you will have 24 and 25 covered and Next week, when we take the, lex the lab test, you have all of digestion in some way, shape, or form covered as well. All right? Remember, this is going to be for the students in my usual normal class. You will have one 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. You can write front and back. It must be your handwriting. It must be your sheet of paper, no one else's. And you can use it to help you take the test. For my hybrid classes, your test is online. So you will take it like you do your quizzes, and you can have open book, open notes available to you, OK? Uh, know that everything is timed. So what you need to do is still prepare for these tests as you normally would, read the chapters, listen to the lectures. Because if you're trying to look up every single answer, you're going to run out of time for both the lecture and the lab, um, the lecture and the hybrid classes. OK. So the digestive system. The purpose of the system is to obtain and process nutrients from our environment. Why do we have to get nutrients from our environment? Because we are not capable of making all of the molecules we need to survive. So we can't make glucose from scratch. Only plants that have um, photosynthesis can do that. We can't make all the specific types of um, amino acids that we need for certain proteins. So we have to get them from our environment. And we cannot make all of the different types of um, fats, like the omega-3s, the omega-6s. So that's part of the reason why we have to get those fats from our diet. Okay? So the digestive system is the tube from mouth to anus, where food enters in the mouth through chemical and mechanical processing, is broken down into its smaller molecules, smaller pieces and parts, like amino acids, nucleic acids, free fatty acids, glycerol, monosaccharides, glucose, and fructose. And it's these smaller molecules and building blocks that are then brought across the epithelial lining of our cells into the cells and into the interstitial fluid around the cells. That then leads to these molecules getting taken on into the bloodstream and carried to the liver or taken into the lymphatic system and carried to the liver. The liver ends up being an extremely important organ in that the liver gets to see everything coming in from our digestive tract, so everything coming in through the blood and the lymphatic system. And therefore, the liver can see, are you taking in glucose? And if you're not, then it can potentially turn on gluconeogenesis, right? And gluconeogenesis is then allowing you to maintain blood glucose levels. The liver can see if you took in any cholesterol or any fats and could potentially determine if we need to then make cholesterol or make fatty acids from excess glucose. And therefore, the liver is a good place that we see what's coming in. If you took in a lot of um, excess toxins or chemicals, or it's the liver that sometimes de destroys and processes that, and then the process can be damaged um, from over excess exposure to certain toxins or chemicals. So that's why alcohol potentially leads to liver damage. Um, Overdoing in a lot of different drugs can lead to liver damage because the liver is the place where they're broken down and the liver is breaking those toxins or chemicals down and trying to prevent as many of them from getting into the bloodstream. All right? So the muscular tube is termed the digestive tract, the alimentary canal. It's the oral cavity to the anus. Throughout that tube, we're going to think about what's going on mechanically, what's going on chemically. So what are the enzymes, the proteins coming in that are going to break maybe other proteins or break carbohydrates or break fats or break nucleic acids down? And so we can get smaller building blocks. What are going to be the supplemental things brought in from maybe accessory organs, secretions? Okay. And then mechanically, what is going to trigger and control at that organ? that organ to the next organ, the movement of the, the stuff in the lumen of the tube within that organ and to get it to go to the next organ, OK? 
So in addition to what the specific locations on the tube, there are a few key accessory organs within those areas. So teeth and tongue and salivary glands play a very important part in the oral cavity to help us get initially chemical mechanical digestion going and then lubrication to help get the food to move towards the stomach and without abrasions and tearing of our mouth and oral pharynx and even esophagus. The liver and the pancreas, like I said, the liver plays a good role in getting the idea of what we've ingested, what we've absorbed, and manipulating to make sure the blood supply stays in homeostatic relationship for amino acids, glucose, fat levels, blah, blah, blah. The liver also helps make bile from bilirubin and bile so that way we can better take in fats from our diet. And the pancreas is going to make a lot of supplemental enzymes, a lot of supplemental things that are enhance the chemical breakdown of foods in the small intestines when they're exposed to the pancreatic secretions as well as the intestinal um, secretions from the small intestines. Okay? These are key terms you need to know. So ingestion, taking things in to the, to the alimentary canal. So people that do like suppositories or, you know, put alcohol up their butt or something, I mean, they, they can potentially be ingesting something um, from that way, all right? Mechanical processing is all about the muscle, the movement, and the shearing, tearing that occurs. So it's usually going to involve muscles, teeth, tongue, okay? Digestion, mechanical digestion is another way we can say mechanical processing. When we don't have any disclaimers and we just say digestion, we're normally talking about chemical processing. So digestion without actually saying chemical processing means the same thing as chemical processing. And this is all related to the chemical breakdown of molecules, so breaking bonds between atoms. So making proteins into just single amino acids, making triglycerides into glycerol and three fatty acids, making disaccharides into monosaccharides, making complex carbohydrates like glycogen and starch into disaccharides and eventually monosaccharides. So breaking down foods with the help of enzymatic reactions. You secrete bile into the liver, you secrete hydrochloric acid at the stomach, you secrete pancreatic secretions. So anytime you add to the lumen from something from the intestinal lining or a gland or a duct, those are secretions. And in many cases, those secretions are probably not going to be reabsorbed. They're going to have their effect on what's ever in the lumen, and they're going to become part of your fecal matter. Okay? Be whatever crosses, so those small molecules that our goal of getting into our system and taking across into our bloodstream and then providing as a fuel source or a building block source for cells, those are what we absorb. And anything we don't want to keep, we have too much of, and we've maximized our absorptive capacity towards, we excrete. Okay? And that's what ends up being feces. Now, most of this organ system is within the abdominal pelvic cavity. And if you remember from chapter one, the abdominal pelvic cavity is going to have two serous membranes that are going to form a peritoneal cavity. And you can just say the peritoneum referring to that cavity. Okay. The peritoneal cavity is made up of the visceral peritoneum and the parietal peritoneum. Both are a serous membrane, meaning both have some type of mesothelium, some simple squamous epithelium tied to underlying areolar tissue. There's a little bit of fluid between them known as serous liquid transduate. Okay. This cavity allows basically freedom of movement so the muscles of the skin can kind of move without making the organs jostle as much. And the way it folds in and to the creaks and crannies of the different organs and the space between them and around them, it also helps the freedom of movement so when the stomach is processing, that doesn't necessarily mean the liver is affected, the gallbladder is affected, or the large intestines or the spleen, which the stomach is potentially around and touching. Okay? All right. So when we look at how the peritoneum is folded and makes these kind of big sheets of visceral and parietal membranes, we end up with these mesenteries, okay? And so this is part of the digestive tract is suspended within the peritoneal cavity by sheets of serous membrane and those membranes known as mesenteries. And they form these just kind of big layered sheets that help kind of keep 
the tubing all in place so it's not like a hose where it could get kinked and, and potentially have backlog or problems. Uh, it also keeps it from falling with gravity, falling down or changing in position based upon where, whether you're standing, sitting, bending, all those different things. So they stabilize and attach. Okay? You have two big mesenteries, right? You have the greater omentum and the lesser omentum. And so if you look, the lesser omentum comes off the stomach and actually helps keep the stomach and the liver in their spots. So this is why our liver doesn't fall down towards our belly or our stomach fall in and collapse into our large intestines. The greater one is actually going to play a role in being a bunch of cushion and padding underneath that rectus abdominis area so that way we kind of keep, again, all of these um, tubes of the large and small intestines in place so the transverse colon doesn't potentially collapse down and our ascending and descending colon don't kink and fall inward. Okay? Again, other parts of the peritoneal cavity are going to fall the mesentery and again, other mesentery areas are going to play folds and keep again the backside of things in place. One thing to note is that the peritoneum does not actually go all the way to the pelvic floor. So at some point, the large intestines around that sigmoidal colon is going to actually leave and no longer be a part of the um, peritoneal membrane and cavity. The other thing to note is the pancreas and the duodenum, the C part of the duodenum. And your kidneys are back here, okay? So you have two kidneys. They are all technically in the abdominal pelvic cavity, but the way the peritoneum folds, it folds um, not necessarily around those organs, but in front of them. And so that means that these organs are known as retro behind the peritoneum. And then the, the rectum here is underneath the peritoneum and the bladder and the uterus. Okay? All right. So again, the mesentery proper, there's that thick, again, kind of sheet that helps kind of keep all the small intestines in place, but allows kind of like peristalsis to occur and food moving through the tube in different locations to not alter or problematically cause problems at lower or above areas. Okay? And again, the pancreas and a part of the C-shape of the duodenum are actually behind the peritoneal cavity. Okay? The mesocolon is going to be the mesentery associated with a portion of the large intestines. Right? And I don't think it's, well, you can kind of see the mesocolon right here, right? So it helps kind of anchor, so it's the peritoneal sheets that's going to kind of keep the transverse ascending and descending colon in, in um, place. All of the um, serous membranes, remember the areolar tissue, there's going to be fat in there, so there's going to be storage, visceral fat. There's going to be blood vessels. There's going to be some neurons. It's a passageway for a lot of the big uh, vessels, neurons, and things to run through the chamber, uh, through the cavity, and then into, into the, the individual organs. Okay? Now, histology of the GI tract. At every point of the GI tract, we have an open tube that is technically separate from the body. So every part of the GI tract is going to have some type of epithelial lining. That innermost layer of epithelial lining is going to be known as our mucosa layer. Part of the reason why it gets the name mucosa is because it's going to be epithelial tissue that is tied to goblet cells or cells that are producing a mucus or a secretion that helps to keep the tube lubricated so it's not getting abrasion and torn. And then in many cases that mucosa uh, is also going to produce secretions of enzymes that are going to influence the chemical breakdown of the food. Okay? So everywhere, the mouth, it's stratified squamous epithelium. The pharynx, more stratified squamous epithelium. The esophagus, you're going to start to see some transition there. Uh, the stomach, you're going to see it's actually some simple epithelium. You start to see some uh, potential uh, absorptive capability. Uh, the large and small intestines, you're going to see simple columnar epithelium. And then towards the rectum, you're going to see stratified squamous epithelium again. So that mucosa is constantly changing depending upon what's going on. Where we see a lot of chemical, mechanical, like the mouth, a lot of shearing and tearing, stratified. It's close to the outside environment. Better protection barrier for the pathology side of things. So stratified. Again, with the anus, it's close to an exit hole, stratified. 
Okay. Uh, where we're going to see the absorption occurring, we want simple because we want to make sure we minimize the distance so we can better get in those nutrients for utilization by our cells. Okay. Now, we want to, in addition to having a lot of, you know, simple, small distance for surface area or diffusion capacity, we want to make a lot of surface area. So what you're going to see is, in many cases, the mucosa is going to have lots of hills and valleys. It's going to form what's known as villi. Villi is a tissue level. So at the mucosa level, it's going to be the hills and valleys. Each hill, so if we look at each little hill here, there's lots and lots of cells. That's a villi. So villi is a hill that's increasing surface area containing lots and lots and lots and lots of epithelial cells. On these epithelial cells, you'll actually see that they are going to have lots of microvilli. So microvilli is always at a cell level, villi is at a tissue level. Okay. So again, the mucosa is going to be whatever that epithelial is and the immediate underlying lamina propria, that connective tissue, that areolar connective tissue that in many cases is going to have the capillaries, the lacteals, the anchoring, connect collagen and elastin and proteins that are holding the epithelial tissues to the underlying tissue. Okay. The more robust submucosal layer is going to form, again, big hills and valleys, more at an organ level, and those organ level indentations into the tube are going to be your pilicae circularis, and they're going to contain lots and lots and lots of microvilli. So three levels, at a cell level, microvilli, at a tissue level, villi, and then at an organ level, pilicae circularis, all three of those increasing the surface area, the potential ability for cells to interact with whatever's in the lumen, right? And so the submucosal layer is also going to have um, a little bit of a muscle layer that allows this to be stretched and pulled and changed. It's going to have the bigger vessels and arterioles and blood vessels. It's going to potentially also be the place where our, like, Peyer's patches would be located. So if this was a Peyer's patch, you'd expect a lot of uh, lymphocytes and macrophages to be sitting right in that submucosa layer. Okay? All right. Eventually, we're going to get to the big layer of muscles that are going to have circular and longitudinal arrangement and are going to play a role in uh, big levels of dilation, constriction of the entire tube. So this small muscle layer part of the submucosa is going to play a little bit of making sure we, sh you know, can when we are constricting or dilating, uh, we can form those pilica circularis. Uh, when these are doing their thing, that's going to how let this muscle layer potentially um, relax, so then we have the pilica circularis maybe kind of be pulled down a bit, okay? The outermost layer depends most of the time. It's a serosa, the visceral peritoneum. Uh, other times, especially with the C of the duodenum and the esophagus and the rectum, because it's not in the peritoneum itself in those three spots, it's going to be a more connective tissue that's fibrous and dense and strong. So it's going to be the serosa is an adventitia. Okay? So again, the mucosa lining, epithelium, and the little bit of lamina appropriate, areolar connective tissue, holding and anchoring, giving the capillaries uh, and the lacteal funnels um, nutrients and supplies to the cells, and then the minute the cells are taking in nutrients, picking up the amino acids, the nucleic acids, the glucose, the fructose, and the free fatty acids, and helping get them to the liver for, you know, checking, okay? For the mucosa of epithelium, it changes. At different places, it'll be stratified squamous, and then it'll turn into simple columnar, and then it'll turn back into stratified squamous. When we look at the stomach, small intestines, and certain areas of the large intestines, we're going to call those stratified squamous, or I'm sorry, those simple columnar epithelial cells, the cells themselves, we call them enteroendocrine cells. And they have the ability to secrete either hormones or digestive enzymes that are chemically going to have an effect on the food and the lumen and help communicate from like large intestines to small intestines, small to large, small to stomach, what, when the food's to prep coming and the, and the movement of the food through the tubing. Okay. Again, the mucosa layer has villi 
for bunches of cells to have access into the lumen. And then within the bunch of, bunch of, bunch of the villi, the subcucosa and the mucosa together form a um, pelica circularis. And that increases, again, more cells having the ability to interact with the lumen and the food in the lumen. Okay, The lamina propria is that areolar connective tissue where it's going to have the very endings of nerves, endings of our capillaries, lymphatic vessels, and a few uh, smooth muscles and lymphoidal tissues. Okay. Um, it's going to tie very nicely into, again, a muscularis mucosa, which allows a little bit of changing the picularis and the um, intestinal mucosa um, exposure to the lumen as the lumen needs to expand or decrease. The submucosa, again, going to be where the bigger, more um, robust arteries, arterioles, veins, and lacteal vessels will be. Right? You're going to see um, there's bigger uh, groupings of the, um, what do you call it, the Peyer's patches, the lymphatic cells, and you're going to see a lot more of the neurons related to the enteric nervous system. Again, your enteric nervous system is almost a separate autonomic nervous system. So if you go back and look at the autonomic nervous system from chapter 16, uh, you, we spent a lot of time, hopefully last semester, on just parasympathetic and sympathetic. And parasympathetic, which is eat, rest, digest, does influence the GI tract. But the GI tract has its almost own entity of nervous, nervous tissue and control, and that's your enteric nervous system. And so that enteric nervous system is going to play a big role in telling the stomach to churn letting the stomach communicate muscle-wise and push out food into the small intestines, and then the small intestine being able to mechanically mix and churn and then move that food to the large intestines. All right. So um, all of those neurons need to have communication into and out of the external muscle, muscularis external layer and the submuscularis uh, mucosa layer, and so they're going to hitch a ride in the serosa. So you see them here and then between in the um, muscularis layer, okay? That muscularis external layer, except for the stomach, it's two layers. The stomach is three layers. So it's usually muscle in a circular arrangement and muscle in a longitudinal arrangement. And that allows you to change diameter and potentially change length. It also is going to be tied to peristalsis. So some of these cells at different areas and parts are going to have pacemaker ability and going to be able to rhythmically contract once or twice a day, leading to a big mass movement of food to go and be pushed through the system. Okay? There is a little bit of parasympathetic input here, uh, but again, most of your GI tract is auto-controlled by the enteric nervous system. The outermost is the most cases, because most of the organ system is in the peritoneal cavity, is going to be a visceral peritoneum membrane. All right? and, um, but because we don't have the peritoneum in the mouth and the pharynx and the esophagus, you are going to see the adventitia, and then the rectum is also going to see that, right? a more dense connective tissue. So in summary, at this point, the GI tract is a long tube. At any given point in time, we're usually talking about the layers. And it should be four layers. The mouth, the pharynx might not have four layers. Okay? The innermost layer is always going to be that epithelial layer. And we're always going to look at what, what is it about these epithelial cells that help it potentially absorb or handle the stress of the mechanical chemical process. The submucosal layer is going to help connect the epithelium to the rest of the tube and is going to be a big spot for the entry exit of nerves, blood vessels, lymphatics, and the white blood cells are going to hang out a lot in there. Okay? Um, the muscularis external layer is going to have those two layers of smooth muscle usually arranged in a circular and a longitudinal format. And then the outermost layer that keeps everything anchored and in place is either going to be the visceral peritoneum or an adventitia. And again, it just depends on if, where the organ is and if it's inside the peritoneal cavity or not. All right, so let's start looking at functionally what's going on. There are muscles in the innermost muscularis part, mucosa muscularis, and then there's the two circular on the outer part. 
So there's a lot of potential control with smooth muscles in the digestive tract. So what we want to see is at certain points in time, the muscles are not necessarily moving through, to, through the tube, but helping with mechanical processing. So there is going to be some control of the system related to how to basically mix and, and continue to contract and change the shape of the tube to better mechanically process the food. And then there are going to be triggers and signals to say it's time to move the food down to the deeper portions of the, of the alimentary canal. And that's going to be related to, again, your mass movements, which normally are tied to pacemaker cells, and they're going to work once to twice a day. And then the rest of the time, you're going to do coordinated peristalsis contractions to try to just keep food moving through the tube. Um, and that happens basically following food coming through the system. So the stomach, you know, starts sending boluses into the small intestines, and you do peristalsis to kind of keep it going through the tube so you can continue to accept food from the stomach. Okay. How does peristalsis work? All right. We're going to see that the circular muscles are going to coordinate so they constrict and form a little kind of like valve so the food can't go backwards. And then that wave of contraction and little valve is going to continue to move in the direction to move the bolus further, deeper, down towards the anus, the distal portion of the tube. And it's all coordinated. Um, it goes back to a little bit of the neurons, the way they control the muscles, the way the um, muscles, the smooth muscle cells are working together to let calcium calmodulin work with their myosin light chain kinase, um, and they are touching each other and the wave of contraction and excitation occurring. Okay. When we look at, okay, so mechanically and chemically, we want to mix and move around food at any given point in the system. Some of it's under voluntary control, like your mouth, you can chew and some of that's under voluntary you know, you chew yourself. And then the anus, the expulsion, there's a little bit of voluntary control. But once things get swallowed and don't make their way to the rectum, and then there's a little bit of involuntary control going on. And the involuntary control and the knowing when to, when to let the food leave the stomach, when to let the food move from the duodenum to the ileum, when to get the food into the large intestines, that's a little bit of a complicated process. And there are inputs that influence the timing of it from neurons. There are inputs that come from hormones, hormones in the GI tract that are communicating between the different organs. And then there are local changes that are occurring as, you know, the stomach secretes stuff into the small intestines, it secretes acid material. So that acid potentially is going to change what's going on in the small intestines to protect itself. Right? And then the food content itself could influence things, so whether it's rich in fat or rich in carbohydrates. That could influence which hormones continue to be uh, secreted within the digestive tract, prepping the next organ system to know, hey, lots of fat, get a lot of lipase and bile ready. Or, hey, lots of protein, get a lot of um, enzymes like tryp tryptophan, uh, not tryptophan, trypsin and pepsinogen ready to break them down. Okay. So when we look at what, what, once we swallow, how quickly things move into the stomach, how long they sit in the stomach, how then the stomach moves it out, there's a neural part to that. There's a hormonal component to that. And then there's some local mechanisms to that. Again, getting it from the stomach to the small intestines, movement in through the small intestines. There's hormones that control that. There's nerves that control that. There's local control that, that happens. And so on and so forth. Right. On average, um, food is going to be in the digestive tract, mouth to anus, anywhere from 48 to 72 hours. And so we don't want it to be in there less time because that might not be sufficient. So part of what these mechanisms are doing are try to make sure it's slow enough that we do process it efficiently, effectively, and can get nutrients from it. But once we've gotten the nutrients we possibly can, we're getting rid of it. So it's long enough to get the processes a chance to work, but fast enough that we don't end up with a backlog of excess material we can't do anything with. Okay? So that's kind of the control. All right, so let's dig into the each, each site. The oral cavity, the start. The opening is the mouth, so that's the anterior part. The oral cavity is also known as your buccal cavity. There's a bunch of things going on in that. First, you sense. So you get an idea of the food and the textures and the taste and the, um, the temperature and if it's painful or not. 
You mechanically process. You move the food around so your teeth, your tongue, and your palate can press into it, break it apart mechanically. You lubricate with liquid and mucus from your salivary glands and your mucus glands. And then there's a little bit of chemical digestion because saliva contains enzymes such as uh, salivary amylase. And salivary amylase can bring complex carbohydrates like glycogen and starch into a disaccharide maltose. You also can make a little lingual lipase. And so lipase uh, breaks down triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol. And so by the time your food is being swallowed and moving into the esophagus, Proteins have only been mechanically digested. Carbohydrates have been mechanically and a little chemically. Fats have been mechanically and a little chemically digested. Okay. Again, we have stratified squamous epithelium. There's some keratinization, but not a lot. Uh, and part of that is because we don't want um, like the inside of our nails to be the inside of our mouth. We want some pretty lubricated um, areas of our mouth. All right, other landmarks. The mucosa of the cheeks are supported by pads of fat and the bucinator muscles. Labia, the lips are continuous with the cheeks. They just change a little bit in their pigmentation. The vestibule is that little bit of space between the cheeks and the teeth. Your gingiva is your gums. Your hard and soft palate are considered the roof. So that's the boundary, your superior boundary. And then your posterior boundary is going to be the two uh, arches, and then how the soft palate becomes the uvula. Okay. Your inferior is your tongue. So when we look at those pharyngeal arches, as food is beginning to be manipulated towards the back of the mouth, towards the pharynx, the arches are a way for you to uh, help catch food, especially big boluses, before they're ready to go into the small esophagus. But they're also a way for sensory purposes to let you know when you're ready to swallow. Right? There's two. There's an anterior and then there's a posterior arch. So the more anterior arch is known as the palatal glossial arch, and the palatal pharyngeal arch is the more posterior. I would potentially ask you on the lab practical the question, identify or name the most anterior of the two arches in the mouth, right? Or I'll ask you posterior. So I do expect you to know which one's which, and I will ask one question on the lab exam on that. Phosphuses are the passageways between the oral cavity and the oral pharynx, and basically behind the arches and behind the uvula. Okay. The tongue, again, is that posterior border, and the tongue plays a big part in the sensory and the mechanical processing. Right. So the tongue, to help it get texture and feeling and taste buds, is going to have lots of different structures to it. And you are expected to know this for one station on your lab exam, the different types of um, taste buds and the location of them. So the circumvallate, the fugiform, and the filiform papillae. They play a role, again, in giving you information for taste as well as texture, touch, pressure, temperature. Right. Some of the cells within the tongue are what are actually going to make mucus that just becomes part of your saliva, saliva. And the enzyme lingual lipase actually comes from the tongue. It doesn't actually come from your salivary glands. Just be a note of that. Again, the tongue has an oral portion and a pharyngeal portion. And the oral because it plays a role in speech. So when people have this part cut or removed, it can affect their speech affect the way they make you know, air move out of the mouth. Uh, the lingual papillae, the circumvent papillae, roughly marks the boundary between the body and the root of the tongue. Underneath the tongue, there's usually like a nice like archway, and people sometimes get it pierced. That's your lingual frenulum. On the side of that lingual frenulum is where the ducts are that are allowing saliva from your submandibular and lingual glands to exit. Your tongue movements, again, gross movements. Um, and fine movement, so it does gross control, and then there's fine control, but most of that's coming from the hypoglossal nerves. Right? Saliva is coming from your salivary glands, three sets, so two parotid, two submandibular, two lingual. Saliva is mostly water, but it'll have, again, a little bit of mucus, some enzymes, buffers, most of the food we eat being acid, uh, we want to buffer that. And then there'll be even some antibodies, some immunoglobulins, to help kind of, again, first tier defense, try to get some identification of any pathogens coming in with the food. OK? 
Okay, and you'll have some glycoproteins that'll make uh, the saliva a little slimy. Uh, and then most of saliva is coming from the frenulum underneath the tongue, uh, that submandibular gland. 25% is coming from the parotids, and then a 5% from the lingual, sublingual. Okay. Again, the key enzyme from the saliva is the salivary amylase. Amylase is going to break down complex carbohydrates to maltose, a disaccharide. There's a little bit of lingual lipase, but again, most of that's coming from the tongue cells, not necessarily the salivary glands. This picture, there's a model. This is to help you with the model. This will be one station on your, uh, on your lab exam. And on here, you can see that the parotids are right around the cheek and the ear, uh, and they're going to be underneath the zygomatic arch, and they're going to have a nice long parotid duct that lets you secrete saliva towards the superior or um, on the tongue. Underneath the tongue, that's where the submandibular and the lingual are, and they're going to release through that duct by the frenulum. Okay? And that's just kind of showing you the submandibular glands um, are in the mandibular grooves. They secrete buffers okay, on either side of the frenulum. Saliva is going to do a lot of different things in your, in your mouth. One, lubricate to help mix when we're mechanically breaking down and protect the uh, system, flush it so things don't grow on your tongue, your mouth, your inside of your cheeks. Uh, it's going to help chemically with that amylase break down, and then because it's going to expose and mix in the lipase, it's going to help the lipase break down the fat. Right? Now, your salivary glands are tied to not the enteric system, but to the autonomic system. When you are running away and trying to survive, you might find you have dry mouth, cotton mouth. So when you do a lot of exercise, you might find, yeah, you're dry. Part of that's related to, yeah, the sweat is being utilized, you know, for temperature purposes and redistributed. But the other thing is your salivary glands actually are suppressed when you have sympathetic outflow. So you don't make a lot of saliva when you have sympathetic, so fight or flight going on. On the other hand, when you have parasympathetic outflow, which is associated with eat, rest, and digest, you would expect to see salivary um, secretions to increase. Okay? And all of that's from our cranial nerves. All right, teeth. Teeth are going to play an important role in the oral cavity for mastication, for chewing, for tearing, mechanical processing. Okay? Now, histology. Histology, the teeth has three layers, the enamel, the dentin, and the pulp cavity. Anatomical uh, in the, uh, features, the exposed part of the tooth is the crown. So the crown will actually contain all three layers. The neck is the part of the tooth that is going to be surrounded by tissue, but not necessarily bone. And then the root is going to be the part of the tooth that's completely encased in bone. Right? So when you look at, again, two stations, the histology of the tooth refers to enamel, dentin, pulp cavity. That is enamel, that strong calcium vitamin D. This is looking at dentin, the matrix that is bone. The difference between dentin and other bone matrix, no trapped osteocytes. But because teeth, Dentin enamel is very similar to bone matrix. Anything that happens that would be hampering bone matrix could potentially manifest as a tooth or a, t a teeth problem. Okay? All right, other parts of the tooth. So again, crown, neck, root are the big three anatomical features when we look at exposed, covered with tissue, covered in bone. Right? Now, the root canal is the deep part of the pulp cavity that is going to extend down into the root and is going to be where the major nerves, blood vessels are coming in and out. Okay? The physical hole is the foramen. It's apical because it's closest to the basement of where the root is tied to underlying tissue. Aviolus is the entire socket. So for this tooth, the aviolus is both areas that the roots are kicking in or, or tying in. The periodontal ligament is the connective tissue connecting dentin to mandible or maxillary muscle, uh, bone. So it, again, ligaments bone to bone. Within that connective tissue, there will be some additional extracellular matrix that is cementin that is going to help anchor the periodontal ligament. Okay? All right. The gums are known as your 
uh, gingiva, and then you have these little indentations. And part of the reasons why they want you to floss is they want you to get a little piece of material between the tooth in that neck and the gum in that little divot, that sulcus. So that's the gingival sulcus. Two sets of teeth, baby teeth, milk teeth, deciduate teeth. You get them anywhere from four to five months. They start coming in, and you usually get your two-year molars. You start losing them around the age of six, and then you start working on your deciduous teeth. And then your wisdom teeth normally come in around high school and 20 years of age, usually. And for many of us, because our wisdom teeth are following all of our dental work and our braces and the manipulations we've done to make our teeth straight and perfect, we go ahead and remove them and don't ever let them come in so they don't mess with our dental work that we've gotten as teenagers. All right, this will be some of the questions on the lab exam. Incisors, cuspids or canines, molars and bicuspids. Okay, so know them on the model, know them by characteristics. Which ones do which? Which ones are the front of the mouth, the incisors? Canines, you only have the one of them, usually, you know, like your vampire teeth, sharpened, right? Molars are the way in the back, have three or more roots, flattened, and then the bicuspids are um, flattened crowns, but still a little prominence to them, uh, and they help with the molars with crushing and mashing. Again, mastication is a process of the tongue, the muscles of your face, Voluntary control, working together to get food uh, mixed with saliva and torn physically down in the mouth. The pharynx is going to be the passageway towards the esophagus. It's both shared with the respiratory and the digestive system. Okay? The pharynx has a little bit of taste, a little bit of water receptors as well. Okay? The esophagus is going to be the big tube running with the trachea, and then it will separate once the trachea divides into the bronchi, and will head down through the diaphragm uh, and connect to the stomach. Right? The very top of the esophagus has basically kind of like a valve to prevent um, you know, air from kind of going in. The epiglottis is really going to help prevent food going in, but that's known as the upper esophageal sphincter. Okay. The lower esophageal sphincter, we usually spend a lot more time on for people with GERD and reflux because it's that receptor, that sphincter, that allows the acid to potentially backflow and cause all the damage in the esophagus. Part of what you're doing when swallowing and gagging is you're manipulating that upper esophageal sphincter. Okay. And so part of strokes is relearning how to control that upper esophageal sphincter so you learn to swallow again. Right. When we look at the mucosa of the esophagus, it's non-keratinized and there's some stratification to it. Uh, the lamina appropriate is an areolar connective tissue. There is a muscularis mucosa that allows the esophagus to have a little bit of um, control and movement to, for the mucosa layer. And there's lots of folding and expansion. And then if something is really big, it can even fold and expand the esophagus and push it into uh, the trachea, as we saw with the respiratory system, through that trachealis muscle. The muscle layers, they're irregular. There's a little bit of skeletal muscle present, again, because you control swallowing towards the upper regions. And then um, the rest of it is smooth muscle. There's no serosa, no visceral peritoneum here, because this is not even in the peritoneal cavity, this is in the thoracic cavity, and so the connective tissue is going to be thick and hold the esophagus in place, anchor it to the aorta and the small um, and the trachea, and is going to help keep its spot. Gravity is going to assist of quite a bit with the movement of food in the esophagus, because uh, of the way gravity food moves down, um, but if food, if you're laying down or not completely able to use gravity, um, the esophagus does have a peristalsis ability, does have ability to muscle contract and help push food towards the stomach. Okay. So a key to getting food into the esophagus is all about getting that upper esophageal sphincter, the arches triggered to generate a swallowing reflex. Swallowing is also known as deglutition. It's pretty complex because there's parts of it that are voluntary and involve skeletal muscles, and then there's the parts of it later on that are tied to the um, smooth muscle working by itself involuntary. So the buccal phase is, of course, in the buccal cavity in the mouth. 
The pharyngeal is going to be, once the food passes the arches, energing the pharynx. And then the esophageal, once we get it into the esophagus, heading towards that lower esophageal sphincter. So phase one, it's all about the tongue pushing the bolus against the uvula, against the arches, forcing relaxation down into the esophagus, forcing the epiglottis to close over the trachea, and the food to head towards the um, the nasal, um, the orthopharynx. The uvula here needs to kind of con keep the food from going into the nasal passage. Again, all of this, the tongue is controlled voluntarily. Once you get the food to enter into the pharynx, gravity and swallowing reflexes that are involuntary and related to the stretch and the tactile should take into play and continue to help move the bolus into the esophagus. Okay? You shouldn't, you, you have to tie this to the respiratory center to stop breathing uh, so air isn't trying to enter into the trachea as food is going down. The last phase is, again, if gravity is helping, great, but if gravity is not helping, to start triggering the peristalsis, the smooth muscle coordinated contractions of the esophagus to help move that bolus down into the stomach past the esophageal sphincter and the release and relaxation of that lower esophageal or cardiac sphincter. Okay. Our stomach is the next big spot on our alimentary canal and one of the big major organs of this organ system. Lots of things are going on in the stomach. Before, we've had chemical starting on carbohydrate digestion and chemical starting on lipids. But it's in the stomach that we really put a lot of chemical digestion into work and utilize acid and enzymes together. It's a storage point, so that way we can coordinate between the different organs that food moves at a rate that allows us to maximize absorptive capacity. So it can be a holding part, the stomach. Right? Mechanically, we can still, with three layers of muscle, still move, mix, and churn the food around. You are going to see also some other key things come into play with the stomach related to your ability to get vitamins and, and absorption later on. And that is the uh, protein, the glycoprotein intrinsic factor. All right? What is in the stomach is no longer the food that we're used to. So if you think about people that throw up, they usually throw up, and it's usually kind of slimy and liquid. Uh, and has a yellowish tint to it, that soupy mixture of partially digested food is now known as chyme. Okay, let's go. The stomach is a J-shaped organ, right? It's usually located in the upper left quadrant, and then it'll kind of extend towards midline, and then the pyloric sphincter will connect into the du duodenum or the duodenum, and that's towards the upper right side of the uh, quadrant. Okay. The esophagus connection here and right underneath it is known as the cardia region and this sphincter can be known as the lower esophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter. The fundus is kind of the top little J part up here. The body is towards the center and then the end part near the pyloric sphincter is the pylorus. So cardia, fundus, body. When you do gastric bypass, they usually connect in somewhere around here in the body. When you do stapling, they usually staple the fundus to decrease basically this part of the stomach being available, so therefore your stomach gets smaller. Okay. Lesser curve, going to tie into the low, uh, lesser omentum. Greater curve, the greater omentum. All right, in the stomach, the mucosa is going to kind of look like it has hills and valleys. We're not going to call it the pelica circularis here. We're going to call it the rugae. So the tissue forming hills and valleys of the mucosa is the rugae. Behind the rugae is going to be that submucosa connective tissue. Then the muscularis external layer is going to have circular, long, and oblique muscles. The outer part is going to be the serous membrane, uh, serous, yeah, serous membrane, the visceral peritoneum that will then connect into the greater and lesser omentums that are going to, the lesser tie to the liver, the greater tie, that big apron shape um, front part of the body, of the abdominal cavity. Okay? So you can kind of read about that. All right? 
Now, when we look at the mucosa at different parts, all right, so when we look at the mucosa, again, we're looking at the rugae, okay, there are going to be different kind of little pockets of how the cells get arranged. And there are going to be different ways the cells are going to make things into, secrete into the, uh, the gastric juices that become part of the lumen of the stomach, okay? So what we're going to see is the part where we start to see glands, the little indentations and cells around that make lots of the acid and enzymatic secretions, is going to be in the mucosa in and around the body. And then the mucosa in the pyloric region are going to, again, continue to make some glands, but are also going to start to make some of the hormones that are going to communicate to the small intestines, prepping the small intestines for boluses to enter that might have a lot of acidity associated with them. Okay? All right. Your stomach with the rugae, with the muscles, with having the... Um, peritoneal membrane and some space and expansive ability uh, can expand. You can also stretch out your stomach and make it bigger. And that's part of the reason why people get the gastric uh, stapling or gastric uh, surgeries because they can make their stomach smaller. Okay. Lots of layers of smooth muscle of the stomach. There's a mucosa layer, muscularis, and then there's the three big layers in the external layer. Again, the body in the body and in the pyloric region, when we look at the mucosa layer, the mucosa layer is going to have these kind of pits, these indentations, these kind of sulci down, right? Those sulci down are going to eventually lead to little pockets of cells that form um, the cells that can make enzymes and secretions that will be important to the uh, chemical processing of, lume, of the food in the lumen, okay? So the pit is going to be the opening. Down here, it's going to actually be the physical gastric gland, okay? All right, all of these cells are going to be simple columnar epithelium. And the simple columnar epithelium are going to have some embedded in there mucus producing cells that help make a little bit of a barrier, a mucus barrier, so the lumen contents, which can be rich in acid, are technically not eating and acidically touching the cells, the columnar cells themselves. Okay? The pits are the little openings. So here's the pit, here's the pit, here's the pit, here's the pit, here's the pit. The gland is going to actually be the part down here where the cells are going to change a little bit differently from the cells up here and that they're not going to be worried about mucus producing and absorption. They're going to be about making enzymes and different, different secretion things. Okay? So the pit is going to be the part that is the opening to the lumen. When you get to the deeper portions below and you start to see the cells change into different varieties and different secretion making cells, now you're in the gland part of the um, stomach. And this is especially important in the body and in the pyloric, okay? Because in those two segments of the stomach, we see higher amounts of pits and higher numbers of glands. Now, two T key cells are going to be, okay, yes, there's still the enteroendocrine simple columnar epithelial cells making mucus, okay? But what we're going to see is some of the cells embedded in the gland area are going to be located at the very base of the, of the gland, and these are going to be our G cells. We're going to see that we're going to have certain cells that are going to make uh, different secretions from the G and the rest of them. Those are going to be the parietal cells. And then we're going to see chief cells. Okay? All right. The parietal cells are going to be secreting that glycoprotein intrinsic factor. Now, this protein is going to become a big player once we get into the large intestines. So the goal right now in the stomach is to make some intrinsic factor secrete it into the lumen of the stomach so that intrinsic factor can later on play a role at the large intestines 
in helping us get vitamin B12 absorbed into our bodies. The other thing the parietal cells are going to do is make the hydrochloric acid. So when you take drugs that try to suppress stomach acid, you're taking a drug that's trying to work only on the parietal cells. So you're trying to prevent these cells from pumping into the lumen of the stomach hydrogen and chloride ions that then form hydrochloric acid. Okay. So when we look specifically at the parietal cells, normally we see that there's this process, because we have carbonic anhydrase, that carbon dioxide and water combine form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid means I disassociate in the cytoplasm, because it's mostly water, the hydrogen ion and the bicarb. The bicarb, just like in the red blood cell, can be exchanged by a protein that can bring in a chloride, let out a high uh, bicarb ion. And that bicarb can then become a big buffer, okay, in our interstitial fluid and in our bloodstream. The hydrogen, again, because the bicarb is being used as a buffer, is then going to be secreted out, pushed out, forced out by this proton pump. So sometimes when you think of here about drugs that suppress stomach acid, they're proton pump inhibitors. So they work specifically at this protein that takes a hydrogen ion, which is basically a proton, because it doesn't have an electron, and pumps it into the lumen of the stomach and the lumen uh, of the gastric gland, which eventually uses the pit to put it into the lumen of the stomach. All right. Now to somewhat keep positive and negative balance, the chloride will follow out the hydrogen, leading to hydrogen and chloride being accumulating in this um, fluid area in this in this tube, and it becomes hydrochloric acid. Okay, so pumping out hydrogens means the hydrogen ion concentration is very very high, so the pH will be very very low, and it can get very very low to somewhere around one and a half to two. Okay, all right. So, low pH does not itself digest the chyme, but low pH does potentially kill pathogens that have gotten past the mouth and the, um, the enzymes in the mouth and, you know, gotten into the system past the esophagus. Low pH can break certain bonds between amino acids, like hydrogen bonds. So, low pH can start to, again, kill organisms denature some proteins, inactivate some enzymes, and it can help break through acidity-wise some plant cell walls and some of the connective tissue associated with uh, animal products, animal meats. Okay. Now, the chief cells are going to make a enzyme known as pepsinogen. Okay. Now, this pepsinogen enzyme is not active until it gets exposed to a low pH hydrogen rich environment. And when it gets exposed to that environment, it turns into the active form, which is known as pepsin. Okay? And so when the chief cells are making pepsin, they don't actually want to make it and have it activated inside, because then it will eat and tear away the cells. So they make it as pepsinogen, secrete it as pepsinogen, and then let the environment of the pH being low cleave pepsinogen into the active form of pepsin. And then pepsin's goal is to take those amino acid chains that have been broken by uh, the acid levels and start breaking and liberating uh, amino acids and then breaking and liberating big, long, huge proteins into smaller peptide chains. Other things the chief cells do is they can make renin with two N's in the middle, so it's R-E-N-N, -N, because later on we're going to talk about the kidneys making renin, R-E-N-I-N. -E and that is an enzyme that helps you uh, break down milk proteins. You're going to make gastric lipase. Lipase means you can start to break down fats associated with milk. And then, um, again, I showed you the renin here. This renin is in the kidney and it's going to be related to right, blood pressure. This is with infants and breast milk and milk eating. Okay. All right. So in general, we saw the gastric glands, the gastric pits of the body are going to have chief cells. They're going to have 
uh, parietal cells. They're going to make a lot of hydrochloric acid. They're going to introduce pepsinogen, which will turn into pepsin. They'll have a little bit in infants, gastric lipase, and renin. Now, when we get to the pyloric region, okay, so that's kind of what this shows you here, okay? This is where a lot of our HCL and our pepsinogen comes from. When we get to the pylorus region and near the pyloric uh, sphincter, the, the, the mucosa and the glands are going to change in features. And so, therefore, the amount secreted is going to be changing. Okay? So we're still going to have the mucus producing enteros um, simple columnar epithelial cells appear just like we do over here. Right? But the cells down here in the gland need to start communicating a little bit more with the small intestines and potentially start communicating some with the brain, with the liver, and with the fat cells. So what we're going to see is that the hormones are going to start becoming a player because we need to start as food is entering into this deep portion of the stomach, it's about to enter into the next part of the elementary canal. Okay? So what we're going to see is the pyloric region, we're going to make mucus, we're going to still make a little bit of hydrochloric acid, a little bit of pepsin, but we're going to start to also make hormones that are going to help us communicate to the rest of the GI tract. Right? And one of the hormones you're going to make is known as gastrin. Okay? And it is going to be gastrin from your G cells, right, in these gastric pits of the pyloric and not the body and not the cardiac area that are then going to start to help coordinate and communicate with the small intestines, prepping the small intestines for the arrival of food from the stomach. Okay? So again, in the pyloric region, the gastric glands look a little different. Right? They're a little bit smaller, they're a little bit less tied to the gastric pits. Okay? Gastrin is going to be stimulated by some of the chief and parietal cells to help start coordinating the muscle contractions to push food into the small intestines and preparing the small intestines for the arrival of this acidic chyme. Okay? Another hormone that's going to come is going to be somatostatin. It's produced by D cells, D as in dog. And it is a hormone that is going to be released to inhibit some of gastrin. So at a certain point, you want to, um, you know, maybe it's towards the end of emptying of the stomach, you want to slow down gastric pumping and gastric stimulation. And so that's what somatostatin can do. Okay? And it can be secreted in interstitial space next to G cells. It can be overridden by other hormones. So again, already two hormones from the stomach and they can be overridden and influenced by each other and by other hormones, okay? All right? Other hormones from the stomach, from your parietal and your D1 cells in the fundic region, so back up in the fundic region up here, you can make a hormone known as ghrelin, okay? Ghrelin is going to be able to communicate to the brain to tell you when you're hungry, and then the lack of ghrelin will be leptin, which will tell you when you're full. Okay? So when the fundus doesn't have food, because all the food's down here in the pyloric, it starts secreting ghrelin to maybe tell the stomach, hey, I'm kind of empty, so can you fill me up? And then the antagonist, leptin, is going to be produced when we want to know that the stomach is full. Okay? Obistatin is another per, um, sorry, another hormone produced in the stomach that, in addition to ghrelin, can also curb appetite. Okay? And actually, the gene, so when you have DNA and you have like A, T, C, G, C, G, blah, 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 and then that becomes the RNA, T, a, G, C, G, C, and then that RNA, right, TAC becomes the amino acid glycine, and CGC becomes the amino acid alanine, and blah, 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 right? When you get all those proteins, you end up with this long amino acid, amino acid, amino acid protein. 
technically part of it could be the hormone ghrelin, and then over here, another little fragment of it is the protein obesin, and that's what that, um, that's trying to tell you. And so depending upon if you splice and break off ghrelin or if you spice and break off obistatin will determine which hormone you make. So you make one gene, but whether you make it into ghrelin, the product, or you make the product into obistatin will then be based upon influences on those cells from other potential hormones and signaling molecules. So again, the genetics behind appetite, the genetics behind satiety, the hormone control of appetite and satiety, whether you're hungry or not, is very, very, very complicated. Thus, we don't have a cure for obesity. All right, so let's talk about the stomach. Food has come into the stomach. Food is touching, potentially on how much, food is touching the fundus, the ca cardiac, the body, and the pyloric region. That in itself is stimulating the secretion of parietal cells, hydrochloric acid. That is potentially secreting and stimulating uh, some of the secretions of pepsinogen, gastrin, somatostatin, obistatin, ghrelin, uh, leptin. Okay? But those are not the only ways we control the stomach. Right? We don't always just control the stomach by what is, whether it's empty or full. There is other control related to the central nervous system and parasympathetic outflow. There is control of the enteric nervous system and the short reflexes that are tied to swallowing and the small intestines talking to the stomach and the stomach talking back. And then there are other hormones that can influence, both hormones from the GI tract as well as hormones from fat, from the liver, from the brain. So when we look at the stomach and the activities of the stomach and the functions of the stomach, we see that we can divide what's going to happen basically when the stomach starts upregulating its enzymes and, and hormones and gastric juices to when it downregulates those gastric juices, hormones, and enzymes uh, is going to fall into one of three phases. And the first phase is actually the cephalic phase. And the cephalic phase goes back to, I mean, Pavlov's dog experiment. That parasympathetic outflow, the saliva starts flowing, you start prepping for eating and food coming in, your eyes see foods, you smell food, you taste food, and all of those things occurring in the mouth start to trigger through hormones, through parasympathetic outflow, through little reflexes, through different signaling molecules, the stomach to start prepping for food entry. Then once food is actually pressing on the stomach, interacting with the different receptors of the stomach, cells of the stomach, that leads to the gastric phase. And then the intestinal phase is as the food is ending up processed a little bit, starting to need to enter into the small intestines, how then the stomach preps to move it out and into the next phase of the alimentary canal. All right, there's a lot going on. So that's all I'm going to talk about in this recording. Uh, I will pick up with, again, those three phases and then start into small intestines, large intestines, liver, pancreas, gallbladder, and eventually get us through um, the removal of food. Hopefully I'm going to do that on Tuesday, and my goal is also on Tuesday to get metabolism done. So look for two new recordings on Tuesday, and then... Again, read your book, listen to Anatomy GMC, use the videos, and continue to use the pictures from your book and your lab handout to get you ready for the lab exam on Thursday and Friday next week. All right, that's all I got. Have a good weekend. Happy Halloween. Bye, guys.